everyone. Good morning to others. I'm honored to be part of this amazing and groundbreaking Survivors of Gender Summit. My name is Salamisha Tillett, and I am the co-founder of the organization Alawa Walk Home, which is a Chicago-based national nonprofit that uses art to empower young people to end violence against girls and women. We are gathered here today um, with Kel O'Hara and Kira Jones um, to talk about a very significant issue at this transformative moment in both the work to end violence, um, sexual assault and, and gender-based violence on one hand, and also uh, a remarkable moment in which we're really thinking through the project of prison abolition, uh, defunding the police and criminal justice reform. And so this panel is a conversation that came together at the intersections of these two movements in this particular historical moment. And I think we, we should just jump right in. I'm gonna introduce uh, our, my fellow panelists and then say a little bit about myself and then our lively and really um, uh, provocative and hopefully very helpful conversation uh, will begin. So first I'm gonna start with Kira Jones, um, who hails from Chicago and is a black queer survivor advocate, prevention educator and multidisciplinary artist. She holds a degree in theater and gender studies from Northwestern University. And in 2015, Kara boldly shared her survivor story through an open letter where she recounted her experience being sexually assaulted by poet and activist Malcolm London. Her letter quickly went viral and led to a restorative justice process led by prison abolitionist and black feminist, Miriam Kaba. Kira and Miriam's transparency about the process has educated and inspired many, providing a model for how we can imagine accountability for harm doers and care for survivors without police and prisons. Kira currently serves as the Assistant Director of Sexual Violence Response Services and Advocacy at the Center for Awareness, Response and Education at Northwestern University. And she's also a professional, professional actor and an award-winning screenwriter whose work focuses on Black women's experiences with sex, intimacy and relationships. Her upcoming feature film, Go to the Body, explores sexual violence in the Black community, particularly in activist spaces. Next. Is Kel O'Hara, who is a queer survivor advocate, education equity attorney, and equal justice work fellow, uh, which is sponsored by Intel and Munger, Coles and Olson. And Kel uh, hails from the Bay Area. Their self designed fellowship project, hosted by equal rights advocates in San Francisco focuses on expanding support for LGBTQ plus survivors of sexual violence in school under Title IX. Kel's approach to legal advocacy is influenced by their background in art activism, campus organizing, and trauma counseling. As an undergraduate at Tufts University, they built on their survivor story to create an award collaborative performance capstone about the experiences of student survivors seeking healing and justice on campus. And again, my name is Salam Misha Tillett and I'm the co-founder of A Long Walk Home. I am also a writer, an activist, a survivor of sexual assault, and also um, currently working on a book on Alice Walker's uh, The Color Purple. It's called In Search of the Color Purple, the story of Alice Walker's masterpiece, which I bring up today um, because we'll talk about this a bit, but the way in which art there models a form of accountability and restorative justice. So let's begin our conversation. Um, just thank you both for participating. Um, we're all survivors in this, this space. Um, the summit obviously is centering our stories, but this particular narrative or this particular political project of restorative justice is still a bit abstract to many people. And when it comes to sexual assault and sexual violence, it becomes even harder to tease out and to explain, um, and also to often rationalize to people who think that there's a particular outcome that we should have when people have harmed us. So I would like to talk to you just in terms of your biography and how you came to thinking about restorative justice as a viable process um, to working through and to accounting for sexual harm. So Kira, do you wanna go first and then, and then we can pass it over to Kel? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so I kind of came to 
the restorative justice process almost by accident. Um, I had previously, you know, before I was assaulted by Malcolm, I um, was sexually assaulted by somebody else. And I did press charges against that person. And that was like a really difficult and re-traumatizing process for me. It was something I knew that I did not want to do again. Uh, the police I interacted with were incredibly disrespectful, made it very clear they did not care about me. Uh, I you know, lost a lot of friends through the process. It was very stressful on me and my family um, and other people I cared about. And when I came forward about Malcolm, when I wrote my open letter, I didn't necessarily have the intention of wanting to start a restorative justice process. I just wanted to get my story out there because I felt that it was dangerous for Malcolm to be in the spaces that he was operating in, especially um, under the guise of being um, a black male feminist and of speaking on these issues. And that, you know that's how he targeted me. That's how he targeted a lot of the people that he ended up harming. Um, by, use, by weaponizing like the language of the movement, the language of feminism to, to get women to be, black women to be comfortable around him. So I wanted people to know what was going on so that they could protect themselves. And when the letter ended up going viral, um, Mariam Kaba reached out to BYP 100, which Malcolm was, um, had a leadership position with them at the time. And Mal uh, Mariam was like, you know, I'd like to offer to uh, lead the restorative justice process for this if Kira is interested. And I've been working with survivors for many years at that point. Um, I actually um, now advise the student group that I was in. So um, I was like, I'd heard the you know term restorative justice before and you know was not able to ever really get an answer about like what that was or what it looked like. And so when Miriam offered it, I was like, you know, actually I would like to, to do this to see what this is so that I can explain more and provide information to the survivors that I'm working with. So uh, that's part, that's a lot of the reason I agreed to do it. And I also, and that's why I also asked that the uh, process be made transparent so that other people who are interested, other survivors who are interested in restorative justice can see what one process looked like. Um, so that is how I came. So Miriam kind of pulled me in and, um, you know, I'm very close with her and it had a, such a huge impact on my education as a prison abolitionist and as a black feminist. Hmm. Kel? Yeah. So, um, my, I had a, a longer road to learning about restorative justice. I, um, was sexually assaulted in college, um, when I was studying abroad. And so title nine was not, um, or any sort of campus solution was not available to me. Um, and when I got back, um, it was sort of the mid Obama era campus sexual assault um, movement. So um, I ended up being involved in that um, and then went on to be a, a rape crisis counselor at Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan um, and really saw there, I think that was my first real experience seeing the ways in which um, the police and the criminal legal system really do not support survivors are not a viable option for so many people. Um, and then went on to law school and was thinking a lot about, um, you know, both my past in um, campus work um, and these more community-based, student-based um, types of um, accountability um, versus what I was seeing in law school. A lot of my friends were public defenders, um, hearing them. I think that was really my first time hearing about restorative justice as, a, as an option. Um, and so really started increasingly thinking about um, when the criminal legal system, as a lawyer, when the criminal legal system is not something that I personally um, believe in or want, um, what else is out there? And I started digging into restorative justice more then. So my direct work is not um, about restorative justice. I'm not a restorative justice practitioner. I am an attorney, um, but I try to integrate restorative principles as much as I can, because I really think that um, I want to believe in a world in which um, you know, we are like staying in community, we're holding each other in community, we are not disposing of people. Um, and I think I've been lucky enough to learn from some really incredible um, RJ practitioners along the way. So it's been a really interesting process for me as I start my legal career. Um, I've only, I graduated from Berkeley Law a year ago. Um, so it's been a really interesting process for me to think about how do we incorporate these different, um, these different modes of justice into um, a traditional legal sphere as, as available and when is it not available and how do we distinguish between those things? So um, I have a question about the role of the traditional legal system um, 
for survivors. So um, I've written about this in, I never uh, called it rape, but the introduction to it. And in my own case, I went to the, you know, sex crimes unit, I went to the DA, I told my story. And um, legally, in the, the time period when I was coming forward, um, what, what I experienced as rape didn't legally fit under um, the definition. So at the time, and this is like the mid 90s, um, what we think of as acquaintance rape, or if there was no force, this is what the DA told me, there was no, there was no force in the sense of threat of, you know, life, there was force in, in terms of sexual assault. But legally, I w didn't fall under the auspices of rape. And so it took feminist activists and feminist legal advocates to really help change the laws to, um, to, to, to what we all now will understand to be rape, no means no. Um, to be considered rape. So there's this history of in the American law in which activists have always been having to advocate for wider definitions of rape to be considered under jurisprudence, right? So statutory rape laws um, get, you know, at one point it's 18 and then it changes to 14, for example, in, in, in the particular state. So I'm curious about the fact that the law always has to catch up with the activists. So even the law as we know it to be is not a static concept, um, but that it's always been, and oftentimes an interracial coalition of activists advocating for more expansive definitions of sexual assault to account for the injuries that people experience. And so I was curious, in your cases, have you seen, um, since we're thinking about alternatives, but I want us to still think about the way in which the traditional legal system is behind the curve. And so therefore that, means that we have to insist on alternatives. What's your experience been with survivors um, whose experiences are clearly violations, but just don't, for whatever reason, get prosecuted or don't um, get forward to the criminal justice proceedings? Um, what have your experiences been in, in that case? And, and, and maybe that's why we've all kind of turned to other practices as well. So uh, my work specifically focuses on education law. So I support survivors um, in school through um, sexual misconduct investigations, things like that. Um, and so I don't, and it was a very intentional choice to not work in the criminal legal system. Um, mm -hmm. I did do some work in law school with restraining orders, um, but this is a good example too. In California, um, back in the seventies, there was, um, you know, a movement for domestic violence to be recognized. We built out a lot of the civil laws um, and and criminal laws around domestic violence in California at that point. Um, but we sort of left out pockets of um, non-intimate partner sexual violence. So in California still, if you are sexually assaulted, raped um, by someone who's not an intimate partner and it happens once, um, there's really not an available civil restraining order for you, um, because of the way that we structure those. Um, and that's a major oversight that we just haven't really solved at this point. So that was something that I saw um, in the civil and, and criminal systems, um, survivors, uh, either the type of harm they experienced not being recognized or a remedy, even if it was recognized in one part of the law or another, a remedy not being available to them. Um, and a lot of people that I worked with, there was a lot of um, mistrust of the system in general, a lot of mistrust of, um, you know, particularly with restraining, restraining orders, what will this actually do? What's the enforcement mechanism here? Um, and so my work really pivoted towards looking at education and um, what does it mean to respond to sexual violence in an educational context for the sake of protecting um, access to education, creating a safe educational environment. Um, so we're not working within traditional legal codes, we're working within school policies, but we are seeing um, there's interplay between what does the mainstream understand sexual violence to be and um, how it's recognized on campus. So in California, we have affirmative consent. Um, yes, me, yes, that started trickling down schools um, and was a point of contention. Um, and you, we see a lot of, um, particularly a, a lot of my work focuses on LGBTQ students. Um, and there, even if it's something in the policy, there's a lot of, um, we end up quibbling over, um, particularly in the in the student context, um, was this actually that? You run into issues a lot of, um, you know, when alcohol was involved, um, that sort of thing, um, trying to dilute the issue, trying to distract from the harm that was experienced, trying to find reasons to discredit it. 
Um, and so I think that the legal definition, the policy definition, whatever it is, is really for me just only one piece of the puzzle. And I think that what survivors um, the survivors that I work with experience is even if they meet the policy definition, the part that's really hard for them is having to continuously assert that what they experienced was valid, that what they experienced was real, that um, they deserve support after that. Um, and so even if they're able to check off, um, you know, the box of the definition, they still have to spend so much time, whether it's in a criminal legal system um, process or within a school process, proving that what happened actually happened. Um, and having to relive that experience and go back over that experience. Um, and uh, I uh, talk to our law clerks a lot about the fact that um, what we do as attorneys is traumatizing. It is re-traumatizing for people. We are asking survivors to share their stories with us, to share their stories with um, decision makers in order to, to prove the validity. Um, and it's not a space that is, it's a, a space that is ultimately all about proving that what happened happened, not about healing, not about um, you know, getting what you need out of that. Um, that's only sort of an afterthought if you're able to meet the burden that we've said that you need to meet. So Kara, I was curious in terms, you said that you went through um, a, a formal legal process on one hand, um, and then um, when you experienced uh, a sexual, when you were sexually assaulted um, with, by Malcolm, you, you decided to, to go through another process. So was that a restorative justice process in your mind both to, to have a form of remedy and redress and healing? Were you thinking about the, the ways in which they can be cooperating or they can be um, existing at the same time um, versus what Kel just talked about, the traditional legal system um, is not really necessarily focused on healing um, proper? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I actually really learned about the, the focus on healing and restorative justice through the process. Like I said, I went in kind of blind with no information um, mm. about restorative justice, especially in the context of sexual violence. And so Miriam had to like <laughs> explain all these things to me. While this is I mean, I'm very, I'm like, thank my lucky stars every day that Miriam reached out. Um, I remember when people told me Miriam was uh, offering, I was like, who's this lady? I don't know who this is. And then she's famous. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I remember really kind of going into it being like, well, I, I want Malcolm to understand and I want Malcolm to be re-educated so that he doesn't, you know, continue to harm people the way he harmed me. Um, and that was, you know, because I know, I knew, especially going through the criminal legal process, that is not a focus of, um, of that. It's to punish the person who caused harm, maybe, probably won't punish them at all. And even if they do, like, that's, it's not effective. We see, you know, um, the rapists who are incarcerated, who are um, put on the sex offender registry, like, they still reoffend at, at very high rates. And some, in some ways, it makes them a better rapist, because now they have more information about the criminal justice system, and like, what to avoid, and how not to get caught, and all of these things. So, and I really, I wanted an acknowledgement um, of what happened. I wanted Malcolm to admit that he did what he did. And I think that's what a lot of survivors want. They want their story to be acknowledged and affirmed and believed. And I think that's why we're seeing so many survivors share their stories on social media or share their stories through through art. Um, and when the threat of, you know, acknowledging what you did <laughs> is being incarcerated, being enslaved, like, of course, you're not gonna admit it. Of course, you're gonna do everything in your power to deny it happened, to discredit the survivor. Um, and all of that just re-traumatizes uh, the, the person who was harmed. It does not, you know, actually lead to healing for anybody. So I went in was thinking, you know, mostly about like how re-educating Malcolm would protect other Black women in the community. And then the first thing that Mayor asked me when I met with her, I was like, well, what do you want? Like, what do you need? What would restore the harm that was caused? Like, where are you in your healing process? What do you need to do? How can I help you? Um, and that was definitely not a question anyone ever asked me during the criminal process that I went through. At most, I think the one time I kind of got a choice, they were like, so would you prefer he went to jail or would you prefer he get put in a sex offender registry? We probably can't get both. And I was like, I don't know that I want either. Um, so I, Miriam, like I had my own team. Um, 
it was Miriam leading and Malcolm had his own team that was, you know, leading his like accountability and re-education, which took 15 months. So I just want to put that out there. Cause some people are like, oh, restorative justice is the easy way out. And it is not. Uh, and Miriam was really mostly in charge of like making sure that I was supported. I had what I needed, was checking in, making sure I went to therapy and all this stuff. And that was truly amazing to have um, the, my healing and uh, my care be centered throughout. Uh, and that's really not something that I see, even, you know, working with survivors now who do decide to go through any type of legal uh, process, whether that's criminal or civil, that's never, I never see that centered. Uh, so, yeah. What is your process? Um, you talked about this um, when we met earlier about the fact that you were never really in the same space or at least initially not in the same space so there's a sense that you are put in it's you know we, we I think in our minds we think of it more like mediation or confrontation um right where the two parties are in the room and then there's this third party there that's a um, neutral or um objective which we know are no, no one is and, and that's not true but I was just curious if you practically just um, quickly talk about a little bit just so people understand um what we're talking about at least in your case yeah absolutely there's a lot of misconceptions about what uh restorative justice is especially from white people white feminists uh, seem to think that restorative justice is it, like you said mediation like you're sitting in a you know kumbaya circle with your rapist and you know talking about your feelings which is that was not it at all uh, as I mentioned, Malcolm and I had two separate teams. So I would meet with Miriam, Malcolm would meet with his folks, the leaders of the teams would meet with each other and, you know, you know, exchange whatever information was relevant. And, you know, if there was something that needed to be communicated back to me, Miriam would communicate it. I never had any contact with Malcolm until the end. And that was completely, like, I asked for that. That was completely optional. Like we could have gone through the whole process and I never spoke to Malcolm. But I, you know, because of my particular situation and because Malcolm, you know, is a writer and knows, like I said, all the language of the movement, all the language of feminism. I was like, I don't believe anything that that man writes. I need to see it. I need to talk to him face to face and I need to see and be accountable and that's why I asked for it but it's, it's people who for people who are interested in exploring restorative justice for sexual violence or uh partner violence like you don't ever have to uh communicate with them so that is I think the biggest misconception that I see but there's you know other ones for sure. Raquel in terms of misconceptions and then I do want to talk about limits and possibilities as well so but um in terms of the misconceptions we were talking about um moments when you've been accused of not being supportive of survivors. Um, so Kel, do you want to, even though of course that's that's the position you come from and that's what you're doing, but these misconceptions that this is this cannot be a survivor-centered uh, process, that it is um, a, primarily about those who have inflicted harm as opposed to those who, who experienced it. And if you talk about your experience, you know, being um, misperceived and then how you've uh, tried to explain or, or uh, contend with that misconception. Sure. So um, I think I also came, like, I'll just be honest that um, I definitely uh, was exposed to, came from sort of the school of white feminist thought that um, is more punitive focused, is more carceral. Um, I did American studies in undergrad, and I think that was really helpful for me in terms of getting like a critical race lens um, and understanding like the, the gaps in my in my understanding. Um, and I think that it is just really hard for us to imagine a world in which um, the punitive uh, criminal legal response is not the right one and the just one. Um, and I think that for so many of us, our imagination sort of stops with the system we've been given. And so something that happens a lot um, that I see is that um, when you pursue or suggest restorative processes, um, it's often seen as um, a cop out, a way of letting um, the risk um, in the in Title IX, we call it the respondent, the person who's caused harm, of letting them off the hook, um, and saying, "Well, if you're not, gonna, if this isn't about punishment. If we're not punishing you, then um, what are we do, really doing here? We're just sort of giving you the easy way out." Um, and what I've really come to is one: I think that that misunderstands um, 
the core motivations of a lot of survivors after harm. Most of my clients, um, you know, as Kara was saying, they want to be heard. They want to be believed. They want to hear, yes, I, um, I caused harm and I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and a lot of my clients, what they, what they say that they want and what the goals that they're expressing don't line up with what they think the legal remedy is. So they'll say, I, I feel like I need to go through the criminal legal system. Um, but they, what they want is an apology. Um, they're, you know, as Kara was saying, you're not really going to get that because the system does not encourage genuine accountability or um, owning what you've done. Um, and so I think that um, challenging that, pushing back on that um, has been something that I talk a lot, a lot about, um, the limits of shame, the way that shame um, and fear really shut down meaningful conversation and change because people would rather run away from what they've done wrong than be able to sit with it and change from it. Um, and I think that the other part of it is, um, is the sense that um, survivors should want a certain outcome. Um, and they often feel like um, there are external pressures telling them that what they've done is, is right or, or wrong. Um, and that um, it is really hard to tell a survivor sometimes, or to tell a survivor that, that they are allowed to choose an option that maybe their parents don't want or, um, or someone else doesn't want. So a lot of my clients will say that they feel like they need to go through this full process to prove that they were right. They feel like they need to meet this, this um, legal standard to prove that they were really um, experienced what they experienced. Um, and I, the other part of that is that I think, and this is something I think about a lot and I think is important in, in restorative contexts is um, what I don't love is when a survivor who has not been ex exposed to restorative principles before, maybe doesn't want that, um, is feels pressured into a restorative process. Um, the model that I learned um, in trauma counseling is the empowerment model. So um, the, the way that trauma operates is it, it takes away agency, it takes away power uh, and a way of, of healing from that is giving power and agency back to the survivor. Um, and I think that it is um, a real issue that um, that when a survivor doesn't have that in their frame of reference, when it's not something they're familiar with, it's maybe not something they want um, in a moment of trauma and a moment of confusion, um, feeling pressured into something that they're not sure that they want. Um, and I, I do think that um, there are uh, valid concerns about uh, when a survivor has, has fully opted into a restorative process versus when they feel pressured. Um, is the restorative process being suggested because we want healing for the survivor or are we suggesting it because we want to avoid punitive models? Um, and where is, the, where is the motivation coming from? All these things I think are really important. And I think that grappling with um, any system can be used harmfully or supportively. Any type of accountability process um, can have the wrong priorities and center the wrong parties. And I think that um, being able to engage with that and acknowledge that without completely running away from it is a really important part of this for me. And um, trying to hold that my work ultimately comes from a place of compassion and growth, um, particularly working with students, I really want to believe um, in young people's ability to learn and change. Um, is really what I continuously come back to, um, how that um, I think ultimately is more aligned with what we want for survivors um, than um, forcing people into a system that, uh, you know, the dominant um, criminal legal perspective has told us we should want. Yeah, yeah I actually want to add to that really mm -hmm. quickly. Uh, so I, I all co-sign everything that Kel is saying, and I actually, you know, I experienced that when, um, so there's been other survivors that have come forward that have been assaulted by Malcolm. And one of the times somebody came forward, I got attacked on social media. People were saying, you know, it was my fault because I decided to do restorative justice instead of doing something that was more, whatever the, and these were black women that were coming at me. They were saying that I was trying to protect Malcolm, that I didn't care about black women, didn't care about black survivors, all of these, you know, ridiculous things because they thought that he deserved to be punished. Uh, and I had to, you know, quickly shut them down and explain. I'm like, I didn't do it for Malcolm. I did it for me. I didn't want to go through the restorative justice process. And I think a lot for a lot of folks, especially survivors who haven't gotten the type of justice that they would like to see, sometimes project what they think justice is onto other survivors. And um, 
in, in ways that are really hurtful. Like I, I like broke it down and I was like, okay, so what do you want me to do? What is the right option? Because um, going through a, another criminal process, one, I probably wouldn't have gotten any result, but also even if I did, I wouldn't have been happy with that. It would have been traumatic for me. And I'm a prison abolitionist, so I don't believe in that. Um, I can't kill him because then I'll go to jail. So uh, what are what, what do you want? What do you want for me? And nobody can ever answer that question when you when you break it down like that. So um, you know, I think you know, I know restorative justice is not for everybody. It's not for every situation. I would never push someone to do it or suggest it unless it was something that they told me they were interested in. And you know, even Miriam has said restorative justice is not for every situation. Um, but for some reason, people think that me going through it and being public about it is is me saying that everybody has to do it and I, I don't believe that um and additionally it is um really important yeah I like how was saying that restorative justice has to be consented by both parties um you can't be forcing anyone to to go through it either whether it's the perpetrator or the survivor um, because, you know, if, again, if you're forcing um, somebody who caused harm to, to go through this, they're not going to be genuine about it. They're not really going to be taking accountability. They're just doing it because you're telling them they, they have to or else there might be some other type of consequence. And, you know, I've also been experienced, that, especially, again, you know, it's activist circles where someone has caused me like some kind of harm. And I have been like, so now we have to, because I harmed you, now we have to go through this restorative justice process. And I'm like, I actually, I really don't want to. And they'll be like, but you're not letting me be accountable. Like you have to do this. And I'm like, I, I'm the person who was, you caused the harm. You can't make me do this. Um, and it's happened to me multiple times. So that is another thing like this. It has, like, it cannot be survivor centered if it is not consensual. Um, and so that is something really important for people who are looking, especially to integrate restorative models into their organizations like you still it has to be voluntary you cannot be making survivors or people who experience harm feel guilty for not wanting to go engage in it or wanting some other type of justice I have a, just a kind of a, a question about um you know obviously each situation has a different um like uh, example of what a successful or survivor centered um, process looks like. There's no one size fits all. And so depending on the circumstances and depending on the, the individuals who are participating, that determines you know, how good the outcome is or how harmful the outcome is. That's what uh, I think we've established. And so I was thinking about with along with home, our work is primarily with um, young women um, and girls, right? So. Uh, so questions of, you know, whether, how, you know, children and, and whether they can advocate for themselves in this process is a, a question that, you know, we can wrestle with or grapple with. It seems to be that there are moments when it may not be as easily achieved if a child cannot even give consent to the process itself, right? So whatever process we're talking about in terms of accountability, children just don't have the ability the same way as adults do to to is their parents are determining and so that's an interesting you know that's the population we primarily work with um, in Chicago and so I was thinking through this idea of what happens when young children are sexually assaulted and what a restorative justice process could or could not look like um, there but also I was thinking um, care that we talked about this idea that your process was successful and yet the person who may have participated in it has um, maybe a serial uh, harmer, right? So that, so the both can be true, which is, it's complicated, I think, for people to understand that someone can participate in a process um, and it be successful on one hand, and yet they continue to um, do harm. And so whether they were actually participating in it fully or if they were using it as a cover is, is, is up, it, it, that's on them. But it is a, a question of, um, it's just a, it's a complicated scenario, right? And it's a complicated process. Um, and so I wanted you to just say a little bit more about that notion that you that you were successful and yet and and yet um, you can't control this other person's behavior after that moment and clearly had no control over their behavior in which they harmed you right so yeah so that's something that I've been thinking about a lot because you know some people who have been following the situation may know. <clears throat> 
um, another survivor named Juju came forward a few weeks ago um, about how Malcolm raped her uh, in 2018. So it was at least a year after the process had ended. And it caused a lot of waves because I know how much this, like my process has been kind of used as a model uh, and as a way to imagine how we can have um, survivor centered processes that address harm without police and prisons. And a lot of people were saying that, you know, people who are very critical of restorative justice were using this as proof that it doesn't work, that the process failed. People were actually being very critical of Miriam and I, I'm so protective of Miriam, that makes me so mad. Um, but um, I don't think that the process failed. Malcolm failed. And I kind of try to explain to folks uh, that the process is, the restorative justice is kind of like getting um, one of those meal prep kits from like Hello Fresh or, you know, whatever. Uh, and you have all the ingredients and all the steps to, you know, make your chicken parmesan or whatever it is. You have all your resources to make your meal. If you, if you ignore the, the recipe and you leave the food in the oven for too long, you burn it, you don't get your dinner, that's not Hello Fresh's fault, it's yours. <laughs> so the process was giving Malcolm all the tools he needed to not continue to commit harm. He decided not to use them. So the, to blame restorative justice, to blame me, to blame Miriam is further um, taking accountability off of Malcolm. It's, you know, victim blaming, it, it's wrong, um, just at, you know, core feminist level, but it, it also, no matter what type of accountability you're using, it's still at the end of the day, up to the person who caused harm to change their behavior. No one can force them to do that. Um, the poli police and prisons can't force them. Sort of justice can't force them. It's on them. Um, and it's also on us as a community to be, you know, continuing to hold that person accountable, making sure that they have the resources that they need, that they're getting the healing that they need because, you know, hurt people hurt people. Um, and if, you know, they have trauma that they've left unaddressed, then they're, they're probably gonna be more likely to continue to, to cause harm. And so I think a lot of it was, was mostly on Malcolm, but I also think that there were way too many people in the Chicago um, activist organizing community that were like, great, Malcolm did his restorative justice process. He's done, he's fixed. We don't have to keep an eye out on him anymore. We're continuing to allow him in spaces where he could target black women. Um, and then this happened, you know, all the people that were assaulted by Malcolm were black women, activists and artists. He, ha he targets this group so like, not as a punishment, but as safety, like he needs to be removed from those spaces and people were unwilling to do that because they were more invested in him and black men than they are in black women and our safety. And I think the other thing that's important to name as part of that is um, it's not like the criminal legal system and incarceration are known for their strong rehabilitative powers. Yeah. You see really high re recidivism rates, you see um, sort of this like rotating, um, a lot of folks who are incarcerated are incarcerated again, and that is uh, due to a lot of things, um, you know, over policing of, of black communities and communities of color, um, inadequate social support, et cetera. Um, but it's also, you know, prisons don't heal people. Prisons are not places where, um, for the most part, uh, folks are given an opportunity to um, genuinely re reflect or change or grow. Um, and so, unless you want anyone who's offended to be incarcerated forever, you have not actually solved the problem by suggesting that we go to criminal, the criminal legal mm -hmm. system. Um, and for me, I think it's a really, it's a really uh, negative view of the world to assume that everyone who has caused harm does not want to do better, that we should not be engaging in a restorative process because we should assume um, that if people harm you will continue to cause harm that this comes from this really deep rooted bad place which is not to say that there are not people who um who reoffend clearly um and and again like restorative process the restorative process is not um for every situation for every person um and you know in my work we talk a lot about um when is removing someone from the school community appropriate um one we look at a lot is serial offenders um so is this made a pattern of of targeting um, particularly vulnerable people within this pop within this educational population, in which case um, you should lose access to that educational that particular educational environment opportunity. Um, but 
I, I do think that um, it goes and it, it, for me, that also ties back to the sense that um, survivors are really um, vindictive, that we want um, really harsh outcomes. I think a lot of times we don't, we want genuine change. We want um, people to be able to learn from what they've done. We want to protect other survivors. Um, and I think that restorative, um, any sort of restorative process, it's not that a restorative process never includes something that might be considered punishment, um, such as asking someone to stay away from um, a particular community or group of people, but it's not done for the sake of um, punishing someone um, exclusively. It's done for the sake of saying, okay, like what are the, what are the consequences for your behavior? Um, and I think that it's really important um, it's really important for me to not get bogged down on the most extreme response or the, the assumption that we should go automatically towards the most punitive response. Um, and that restorative justice does not necessarily have to con conflict with, like, there is accountability in that. Um, accountability and punishment are not always the same thing. Um, and I think that um, punishment for the sake of punishment often just hardens people into their perspective and, and makes it so they never really genuinely reflect. Um, um, on what has changed, but ultimately, um, I don't think that we are that it is a cop out um, or anything other than pretty radically um, compassionate, radically caring, and grounded in community um, to believe that people can be educated and can change, um, and that that is ultimately for the better of, of everyone, including the survivor. We, we oh, sorry, I was going to say we all cause harm. What you know might not be sexual harm, but we all cause harm, and for us to say that like nobody can grow nobody can change uh, you know people who cause sexual harm must have to automatically be disposed of you know that means we all need to be disposed of and you know i'm, I'm seeing personally a shift in how people are thinking about consent and understanding accountability and i have you know a lot of students more and more come in because it was brought to their attention that they did something that you know made um, a sexual partner uncomfortable or, or was harmful to them and they're like i didn't know that this was harmful and i want to learn so that i don't do this again like what are those resources and i frequently don't have resources to give them and so i think that we should be giving people you know the opportunity and the time and the space to to learn and and educate themselves so that they are practicing um consent more uh enthusiastically so that you know they don't continue to affect but if we're just if even admitting and seeking out um those resources is going to end you know in punishment and disposal then there's not ever going to be a possibility of a of a world without police and prisons. So we really have to grapple with this conversation. Yeah, and I think it's um, complicated for some people because uh, the fact that so few, going through the traditional legal system, so few um, assailants or harmers are actually, you know, it's 16% that actually end up in, but there's a, there's a, you know, the traditional process, most people who do this harm actually aren't held accountable. Um, and so in some ways, the idea of having a more expansive accountability process, um, it sounds like uh, in terms of the students that come to, to you, Karen, I assume also Kel that you may have experienced as well, um, that a more expansive process also leads to um, an attempt to uh, you know, acknowledge or work through other harms that don't actually necessarily fit into the um, extreme cases of sexual assault, but that are part of the spectrum of sexual violence. So that's actually really, you know, so, so these things can be attended to more, even um, in, a, in a more expansive process. So it kind of makes sense that that would be the case. And yet I do think some people may think, well, but so few people actually get held accountable anyway. Um, so are we limiting that process? So I guess I have just two quick questions. Um, uh, we have 10 minutes left. And so I think you've touched on one of them. So I don't think we have to spend too much time. Maybe just one of you can answer this. Um, so when I said I, I shared my story earlier and I said that I went to uh, the Philadelphia Assistant DA's office and tried to have some form of legal um, remedy for my sexual assault um, and the law wasn't able to attend to my trauma. I, I gave a speech years ago uh, at UVA for all of these schools that were at the time um, being 
and under investigation. So that first round of investigations, all these like presidents had gotten together and talked about and they were, you know, and so one of the next speakers came up to me and she said something that was really profound. She was a DA in Philadelphia at the time and she worked to change those laws. That's why she started doing Title IX advocacy because she found that there was more room in Title IX advocacy uh, than the criminal justice system. And so to me, it was really interesting that I was there in this moment when all these universities had failed, uh, right? And yet that still seemed to be a more viable alternative than the law, criminal justice system itself. And so I made one question about that, if you can answer. And then I think we should get into the arts because um, all of us have come to this issue through our artistic expression and found, I think, a small sense of justice, but also maybe a big sense of healing through self-expression and creative. So one, just anyone want to talk about Title IX within this conversation? Yeah, I would love to. Okay. Um, so, it, Kara, is that okay? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, from like a nitpicky, nitpicky legal perspective, um, the way that Title IX um, is formed under the law, the way that um, the amount of jurisprudence around it, um, there's just much less there than, um, than the criminal legal system. It changes more quickly. Um, it's administrative law. So the, the way that we create rules is different and it's different by campus. So there's a lot more opportunity to change things quickly, to work within individual schools and school districts to implement change. Um, federal law is um, the ceiling or is the floor, not the ceiling um, un unless things are banned. Um, we do, um, I'm sure as many people know, um, there are new Title IX rules that were went into effect in August that have really changed the national conversation about Title IX, but that was the first, those are the first um, binding federal rules around how Title IX is implemented. There was guidance, there was um, Title IX um, case law that came, that um, was developed, but um, so just legally speaking, um, it's a little bit more dynamic. There's more going on. There's more opportunities. Um, but I think what I like about it specifically is um, the chance to work within um, within individual systems and to to really connect with things on the ground in a way that is not quite as constrained by um, these existing rules and and ways of doing things. And uh, that is changing right now. The, the ways that the rules are changing, the um, increasing amount of, um, there's a, a lot more litigation around this than there really has been in the past. Um, and Title IX has become, um, has become this really hot button issue, particularly the idea of due process. Um, what should this process actually look like? Um, but essentially what we're doing is trying to push it closer to the criminal legal system. Um, and that is a problem for me. Um, I think that the, the whole promise of Title IX for me is that it is um, outside of the criminal legal system. It's operating within schools. Um, these are environments where schools can make decisions and support students in ways that are best for that particular community. Um, and I also, I, I said this before and I come back to it a lot, I, I just really believe in educational institutions as sites of, of learning. And um, to go back to something that, that um, you said earlier, um, the um, completely lost that train of thought. That's okay. Um, but no, I, I Title IX has been um, a really a gr really great avenue um, for my work and something that I really value. Um, and I really do um, value the chance to um, to help young people learn and to to give them um, different opportunities. Oh, about shifting campus culture. Um, I think that um, a lot of the sexual harm um, or, or negative experiences that happen on college campuses are, are a result of campus culture and are not don't that don't necessarily meet the definition of sexual violence. I think about a lot of the bad sexual experiences I had in college um, and I wouldn't call them consensual, but I wouldn't file a complaint about it. There's nothing legally actionable there. Um, I wouldn't have brought it to the school, um, but it was still a problem. It was something that stayed with me. It was something that um, impacted my view of, of sex and sexuality and um, how I should be treated. And I think that um, using Title IX, using um, you know campus environments in general to shift how we talk about sexual norms and consent um, and having sexual violence be uh, response be one piece of a larger puzzle um, in terms of how we talk about, um, you know, sex and respect is um, a really important part of that for me as well. well thank you. Um, and Kara, I guess uh, it's my last question. So, you know, you and my sister, who's the co-founder of Alamo, Come Shahrazad Tillit, are 
are very close and we did uh, you know have an open letter in support of you but also the other survivors who've come forward um, but our organization is an art-based organization. When I shared my story with my sister so many moons ago, she then asked if she could photograph my healing process. And it is through the arts that we found a really viable tool of self-expression, of accountability, of healing, of organizing. And so um, when we were discussing this earlier, I was saying that sometimes art stands in the place of the, the legal justice or stands in the place of accountability. And I just wanted you all to, and it, it can't make up for it. It's not full enough to, and it's not fair to art to be the thing that has to stand in for civil society. Um, but uh, it is a place that we've all turned to. So uh, in the closing moments here, do you, you, Karen and Kel, want to talk about how you've turned to art um, to heal and to find a sense of hope and justice? Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say I love a long walk home so much. Uh, they've been so supportive of me throughout this whole process, even before you knew who I was personally, immediately um, were supportive of of my coming forward about Malcolm in ways that uh, other organizations in Chicago have not been. Um, so thank you for that. If you all are not familiar with the Long Walk Home, please familiarize yourselves, uh, get involved, donate, um, buy their Got Consent shirts. They're so cute. Um, but I, yeah, for me, you know, I was an artist. I've been an artist my whole life. And for me, art is protest. Um, it's a way for me to imagine the world that I want to see and also to reflect back the world that I'm, I'm currently in. And, you know, sexual violence, especially is something that is so personal and, you know, there's not a lot of witnesses to it. And even the healing process is so personal. So for me, film um, is a way to let people in on what that process is. I really hate the way that sexual violence and healing from it is depicted in, in most film and television with the exception of like, I may destroy you and a couple of other things. And so, you know, with my film, I wanted to, you know, to your point about like you sharing your story with your sister, I wanted to bring it, you know, focus on sexual violence in the black community, um, a more realistic, one realistic of, um, her journey to heal that does not involve police and prisons and also bring in secondary survivors. Like sexual violence does not exist in a vacuum. It affects the whole community. And uh, it's also a boxing film. I just like to box, <laughs> but, um, but I, I, I wanted to kind of also explore like masculinity and that there that ties to it. And, you know, how are black men involved in the fight against sexual violence? And what are the misconceptions about what protecting black women mean? Cause we also like kind of um, automatically jump to like physical protection. Uh, but I also, you know, I, I do comedy. I, I like laugh. Laughter is healing for me. And um, I think comedy is a great way to uh, shine a light on political issues or, um, you know, gender based issues, racial issues that are that is accessible. So I also have a, another project about, you know, black women and sexual pleasure and the orgasm gap and kind of imagining what it would be like if, you know, we did center our pleasure. We got all the sex education that we deserve that, you know, we, you know, all went to sex shops together and we're not ashamed of that um, and talked about our orgasms because, you know, we can't separate sexual pleasure from sexual violence because if we were pleasure centered and, you know, really um, pleasure is on, you know, if we're practicing consent as well as we should be, everyone's having a good time. Everyone is, is pleasured. And um, so we, I don't separate um, sex education and sexual pleasure from, you know, anti-sexual violence work. Yeah, uh, it looks like we have 30 seconds, Cal. Do you want to say any closing thoughts? And before that, everyone, just thank you for being part of this conversation. I'll hand it over to you, Cal. Thank you both so much. Um, I guess my closing thought would be, um, I was a drama major. I um, was involved in theater my whole life. Um, I'm a drag king now. Um, so, you know, I find, um, performance um, and and being on stage, um, you know, beautiful and, and life-giving and, and part of what sustains my work. But I think particularly um, in the context of healing and survivorship, um, the sense of community, the sense of um, creating with others, the sense of um, supporting each other through that. Um, and I think that um, a lot of the, the love and care and support that I gained from artistic community and um, artistic survivor spaces is part of what led me to restorative justice, so. 
Thank you both. So um, art heals, art gives us a vision of the present and future that we may not have yet realized. So thank you both and thank you Survivors Agenda Summit for this incredible conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.